All right. Good morning. Morning. Welcome. Glad you're here. Hey, brother. Uh, This morning, we are embarking on a new study, as you are well aware. The last few Sundays, we were looking at uh, some ecclesiology subjects, and in particular, the documents of the church. And so uh, over the last three Sundays, we've considered the covenant of the church, the constitution, and the confession. And so uh, this morning, then, we get the joy of starting on a new study, still related to ecclesiology. Hey, brother. And uh, we're going to be uh, coordinating ecclesiology, this ecclesiology study on Sunday morning with what we are doing on Sunday night in the essentials. And so hopefully coordinating those two things will help you sort of better retain all that we're talking about and doing as a church. And I pray that'll be a blessing to you. So this morning we're embarking on a study that we're calling a theology of public life, a theology of public life. There should be outlines available if you want to get one of those. Uh, I gave you this morning uh, a basic outline of the course and we plan to, I plan to introduce the subject, introduce this course of study to you this morning. We'll get started on that in earnest uh, next Sunday. And uh, if, you look, if you're looking at your outline, there's two parts associated with it. And uh, those points there that are listed under those two uh, parts are, will be multiple Sundays long. <laughs> so this study we anticipate may take us through the end of the year. And so uh, we'll explain more as we go with respect to that. So a theology of public life, uh, put the subtitle under that lessons for lot in the city of Sodom. And, uh, I think, uh, that'll become more clear as we work through the study together, but that's sort of the position that we are in today in our world. We are essentially lot. If you're a Christian, then you are, as the Bible describes lot, righteous lot, and you are living in a Uh, the city of Sodom, so to speak, that uh, as it did Lot, vexed his righteous soul, uh, vexes ours as well. And so a theology of public life then is going to deal with that particular subject. And I thought that I would um, begin our introduction this morning from 2 Peter chapter 3. So turn there with me, 2 Peter chapter 3, and let's look at this text together. I think 2 Peter chapter 3 well describes the age in which we live. And then we're going to present to you this morning why we are taking time to develop or cultivate a theology of public life. Second Peter chapter 3, look there beginning in verse 1, where Peter says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that uh, then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, what we see going on now is uh, an example, should be a testimony of God's patience, uh, his forbearance, not willing that any of his should perish, but that all of his should come to repentance, right? Uh, we're in a time period right now, This um, the way that the uh, apostles described it as being the age to come, right? This age, the age to come. We're in this evil, perverse generation, this age. And during this age in which we find ourselves, uh, the Lord is gathering together his elect from the four corners of the earth, Um, And the Lord is patient, not willing that any of them should perish, but that all of them should come to repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, here's the question we're answering. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Uh, During this time in which we live, uh, during this period of increasing wickedness, 
what manner of persons ought we to be in our holy conduct and godliness? Looking for, verse 12, and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So this is the age in which we live, right? Knowing these things, knowing the age uh, in which we live, what manner of persons ought we to be? How should we then live is the way that Francis Schaeffer put that question in a book that he wrote. And we're going to talk about that book as we work through this course of study together. In answer to the question, answer to that question, the reformers would begin to refer to a, a unifying concept that describes the life of the genuine Christian in this age. Um, the entirety of the Christian life, the reformers would summarize, should be lived quorum Deo. Quorum Deo. Now, if you were in service last Sunday night, we mentioned quorum Deo briefly. But that quorum Deo, that word, Latin phrase, meaning before God, or in the presence of God, or before the face of God, uh, the reformers would begin to formulate this summary of the Christian life, quorum Deo, as the way that we are to live in this present evil age. Psalm 56, 13 is where that phrase comes from. David says, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from uh, falling that I may walk, quorum Deo, before God in the light of the living? Uh, quorum Deo came from the Vulgate. It was a Latin translation of that particular verse. And the reformers began to think of the Christian life as in its total, in every aspect, from one moment to the next moment to the next moment, as quorum Deo. There was in the church at that time this sort of increasing um, sacred secular split. Uh, you had a, a clergy class that was in a class by itself, so to speak. Uh, you had what went on in the church. The church was beginning to uh, take over matters pertaining to the state. Um, and then you had the rest of the public, so to speak, living their daily lives would come into the church for that which is sacred, go back out into the world for that which was secular, and there was this increasing secular-sacred split. Uh, it's not so uh, in the Bible. We don't see that, um, that dichotomy in every sense in which they thought of it, um, that all of life, work, school, home, family, including church, vocation, all of it was to be lived before the face of God. When you rise up in the morning, when you lie down at night to go to sleep, even during the night, all of your life lived before the face of God or in the presence of God. In other words, the one who lives by faith is to live all of life under the watchful gaze of Almighty God, under the lordship of Jesus Christ, the one whom we love and the one to whom we must give an account. So, and just as his gaze or his lordship extends to every facet of life, we are to live every facet of life, including every successive moment, under his authority and for his glory, quorum Deo, okay? For the reformers, quorum Deo became um, a unifying biblical concept for a theology of public life. They began to develop, cultivate a theology of public life. Job says this, Job 34, verse 21. His eyes are on the ways of man and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Right. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands, repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You are great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. We are to live before the watchful gaze of an omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent God, Quorum Deo. J.C. Ryle says this, There's no place in heaven or earth where he is not. No place in air or land or sea. No place above ground or underground. No place in town or country. No place in Europe, Asia, Africa, or America where God is not always present. And we know that he's always present in the fullness of his deity at all times and all places. No, so enter into your closet and lock the door, Ryle says. God is there. <laughs> Climb to the top of the highest mountain where not even an insect moves. God is there. 
sail to the most remote island in the Pacific Ocean where the foot of man never trod, God is there. He is always near us, seeing, hearing, observing, knowing every action and deed and word and whisper and look and thought and motive and every secret of every one of us, wherever we are. So we are to live all of life, quorum Deo, before the face of God. That expresses not so much an aspiration uh, as it does a reality, right? It's a reality that all of life is lived before the face of God. So over the centuries, though, that concept twisted and misapplied would lead many into an error called monasticism, right? Monasticism. If we're to live all of life quorum deo before the face of God, well, we need to sequester ourselves away from the world so that we can be holy, right? And monasticism developed. The widespread rise of monasteries, orders of monks and nuns. This movement, the movement um, of monasticism, began largely in the fourth century. Constantine the Great, who was the head of the Roman Empire, issued his Edict of Milan in 313 AD. The Edict of Milan was not necessarily uh, making Christianity the state religion, as it was decriminalizing Christianity, uh, making, uh, giving Christianity state protections. And that would largely end what was before widespread persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. Uh, Christians were being severely persecuted, and this would essentially end that persecution. But as the institutional church enjoyed less persecution from without, less attacks and assaults from without, many began to notice uh, an increasing secularism or an increasing corruption infecting the church from within. Right Where Satan couldn't destroy the church from without, Satan began attacking the church from within. And so some decided that in order to live quorum Deo, our, the, the entirety of our lives before the face of God would require a radical separation, even from the institutional church. And that's where monasticism began to rise. What you see in church history then, during the medieval period and after, are monks and nuns in caves, in deserts, uh, hiding out on mountaintops. There's this um, story of uh, Simon the Stylite who lived 37 years on a small platform on top of a pillar. And they had to get his food up to him and take down from him uh, the effects of eating all that food. And uh, he lived his entire life on the top of this pillar. 37 years he spent up there. There's stories of um, monks and nuns um, essentially cementing themselves into the walls of cathedrals that were being built, leaving a small space for food to be passed uh, back and forth. Um, this was an ascetic, an asceticism, an ascetic lifestyle. It was uh, something they did that they thought would make them holy. Um, asceticism is um, denying or abusing the body uh, for spiritual gain, believing that it will earn merit or earn favor with God. Attempting a physical separation from the world, they separated themselves. They hold themselves up in caves, rocks, deserts, even the walls of cathedrals, all as a means they thought to achieve a righteousness that pleases God. Now, we know that that's not possible, uh, that by no work of the law will men be justified in God's sight, but that uh, through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone is what justifies us. They had a twisted or a misapplied notion of this concept of living a Christian life, quorum Deo. The reformers understood that to live quorum Deo did not mean radical separation. Christians are not to be of the world or to love the things of the world, but Christians are in this world. We're to live in this world. The Lord's Prayer, think about this with me from John chapter 17. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 14. The Lord prays, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. You notice that Jesus Christ didn't separate himself from interacting with sinners, right? He was constantly excoriated by the Jews for eating with tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus prays, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. We're to live in this world, but not be of this world. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them or set them apart as holy. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me 
into the world, what does the Lord say? I also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. The Lord says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, think about this text with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, Paul says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Now, Paul's referring to a former letter that he wrote them, telling them that they weren't to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet, Paul explains, I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world. Since then, with coveters or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Right? What is Paul saying? Can't separate from sinners. Uh, other, if, you, if you attempt to separate from sinners, you're going to have to go out of the world. You're going to have to monkify yourself in deserts and caves, put yourself on a 40-foot on a pole and live there for the rest of your life because you're not going to get away from living in this world any other way. Paul's not telling us to do that, right? But Paul says, now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So that's a text re referring to church discipline, not a text teaching us to sequester ourselves away from the rest of the world. We also have the Great Commission, don't we? In the Great Commission, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, we are, go, we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're not to avoid the world. The Lord Jesus Christ constantly rebuked by the Jews for mingling with tax collectors and sinners. Okay, so for the reformers then, and for the Christian, for you and I today, this means a theology of engagement, not a theology of avoidance. We're not to avoid the world. We are to labor in this world with the gospel. Coram Deo is to live for the glory of God in every aspect of life as we engage this world, this lost world, with the gospel. Paul says we are ambassadors for Christ. It's interesting, you know, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ presupposes that you're a citizen of another country, right? You're not a citizen uh, of this world. You're in this world, not of this world. It presupposes that our citizenship is elsewhere. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We are imploring men on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Right? So what began to flow from this way of thinking was a theology of public life that we first began really to see uh, worked out by the reformers. And that has far-reaching effects on life. It involves every aspect of public life as we see, as we'll see working through this study together. So the collective teaching of the Bible then, with respect to living as pilgrims and sojourners here in the world, not of the world, living quorum Deo, all of life, live before the face of God or before the, uh, the watchful gaze of God under the authority of God for the glory of God. The, this teaching of the Bible constitutes what we would call a theology of public life, a theology of public life. Is the Lordship of Jesus Christ a public matter or a private matter? <laughs> we know the answer to that question, don't we? It's a public matter. The Lordship of Jesus Christ extends to all, whether they submit themselves to it or not, whether they believe it or not, whether they know it or not. <laughs> the Lordship of Jesus Christ is not a private matter. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is a very public matter. Is this, the four walls of this building, is this a monastery no. Or is this a forward operating base? <laughs> it is a forward operating base, an outpost of heaven. <laughs> this is not a monastery. So how am I to walk in this world in a way that is worthy of the calling with which I've been called in every aspect of life? That is a theology of public life. It's the question we're going to be answering. What is our role as Christians in society, in this wicked and perverse generation, do I have a responsibility as a Christian? Do I have a responsibility to this culture? Do I have a responsibility to my government? Do I have a responsibility to lost people? We know that to be clearly true from the Bible. Right? How are we to conduct ourselves in the public marketplace? How are we to conduct ourselves in the public sphere? 
on the job, at the market, with the government, in politics, does God's word have anything to say to our nation? And who are the prophetic voices that carry God's word to our nation? <laughs> do we have a responsibility to our nation to do that very thing on behalf of the Lord? What is the relationship between the family and the church? What is the relationship between the church and the state? <laughs> and what is the relationship between the state and the individual Christian? Individual, individual Christian liberties in our theology of public life. Why would we preach at the abortion mills? Right? Why would we consider starting a school? Why would we plant churches in other areas that are not here? Why, why is there a team in Dahabon as we speak? You know, How are we to live in this world? Answers to these questions constitute a theology of public life. And a, th a theology of public life um, seeks to answer all of those kinds of questions, okay? The difficulty, the difficulty of uh, or associated with a sound biblical theology of public life is that all who desire to live godly in this way in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, right? We'll suffer persecution. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 12, conflict and hostility ensues and conflict and hostility does not ensue when you make a monkery of your faith, <laughs> when you monasticize your faith. That's not when persecution, when hostility, when conflict ensues. Conflict and, and hostility ensues when you confront a world, a lost world, that has embraced the polar opposite of what you're preaching, right? That's when conflict ensues. That's when people get hostile. We are to preach Coram Deo. All of life is lived before the face of God, under the authority of God, and to the glory of God. At the same time, while this world is laboring tooth and nail, to suppress that truth and unrighteousness. Right? We're going to talk about that this morning in the service. This world is laboring, laboring. They have built up strong defenses. They have packed in concrete around the rebar, around the steel that they've reinforced a hard heart with. And so when you come in and you begin to uh, chip away at that with the word of God, that's when hostility, that's when conflict ensues. If we want to monkify our Christianity, so to speak, and hole ourselves into the four walls of this building, then we won't suffer any persecution, right? Who's going to persecute us here but the, the occasional stranger that walks in accidentally thinking this was a pharmacy? Or so, you know, it's like, what did I get myself into, right? No, no we're not. We uh, face persecution. We face conflict and hostility when we're engaging with the world, all right? Uh, there's a song that's quoted with respect to this on a regular basis, right? The, the world has uh, an entirely opposite, polar opposite worldview, an entirely opposite perspective. And there's a song that's quoted on a regular basis that uh, well illustrates that opposite worldview. And I imagine that's because it is uh, just an absolute brazen rejection of God. Listen to the words. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to... I'm on the Beatles lately. I watched a documentary on the Beatles the other, <laughs> the other day. I had this song on my mind. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion to. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Now he's stating that as a good thing, right? That uh, the people, as a result of this empty, bankrupt uh, philosophy, people are going to be living in peace. Uh, imagine how good it is where all the people are going to be living for today, right? You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Now, isn't that little piece of satanic deception interesting? And it's interesting. What a, 
complete load of worldly garbage, right? Just garbage. But you think about that. We just read John chapter 17. And if you know the Lord's high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, the Lord is praying that we may be one. As I am one in you, and you are one in me, that they may become one in us, that we may be one together, right? Talking about our unity with the Lord Jesus Christ and being in unity with the Lord Jesus Christ, how we are one with the triune God as a result of faith in him, having been justified by God, forgiven of all our sin, right? That, that's the unity that, that God has intended for his people, one with himself, communion with God. So what then does Satan do? Satan counterfeits that right? Satan introduces a sham, a counterfeit unity, and he bases it upon this bankrupt, worldly, absurd ideology that we see expressed in this uh, song. All the people living for today, all the people living life in peace where the world will be as one. The Bible teaches that the only way we can be as in one as one is through faith in Jesus Christ. The world believes the world believes that the only way in which we can live as one is if we get rid of him, okay? So we are, if you think with me now about that, that song was written in the 70s, came out in the 70s, big hit. We are closer today to that imagined so-called utopia than ever before. Since that time, We've only come closer and closer and closer to that stupid dream. Far from the utopia that John Lennon and all humanists like John Lennon imagine, their wicked ideo ideology has unveiled what is a devilish nightmare. Has it not? That ideology... We can see before our own eyes that ideology, that worldly philosophy, is a descent into hell, into chaos, into anarchy, into godlessness, into hell. We see people today living as if there's no God, don't we? And increasingly so. The, long, the farther we go, the more that we see people living as if there's no God. We see people living as if there's no heaven above or no hell beneath, as if there's no religion. The fast, by far, the fastest growing religious choice on applications today are the nuns. And that's not N-U-N-S, that's N-O-N-E-S. <laughs> what is your religious preference? None. What is your religious affiliation? None, right? We've never been more irreligious in this country in our history ever. This world has never been more godless than it is today. Um, so we are closer to this so-called utopia than we've ever been before. And are things getting better or worse? Obviously, right? We see people living for today. That's the way people are living today, right? And what has been the result of that godless, bankrupt, immoral, amoral ideology? What the result has been is greed, envy, covetousness, unchecked, unbounded sexual immorality, perversion, hate, division, discord, strife, not only living for today, but living entirely for yourself, right? Entirely for yourself and with it increasing persecution, right? That's the world we're living in. That's where that theology gets you, right? And trust me, it's a theology, all right, that's where that theology, that wicked ideology, that's where it gets you. It gets you, we can see the progression. We're in the middle of that progression and it's only getting worse. And the more that that, you know, what they, what the humanist dreams of as a utopian world, they should be able to see for themselves too, right? That it's leading to abject wickedness. That's part of the sermon this morning in Romans chapter one, that they spend their time rejecting or suppressing that truth in their unrighteousness. Question. They wrote that in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Here we are, 2021. Mm -hmm. That thing's been on 40 years. They've mm -hmm. been propagating that to our yeah. to our kids. It still plays on the radio today. That mm -hmm. it's it's 
like, like you said, it is so pathetic what's really going on. Yeah. Since they took Bible out of school in 1961, mm -hmm. this country has been going straight down the toilet, mm -hmm. and it's obvious to everyone who yeah. knows God can see it. Plain yeah, as, well, we'll see. We're beginning next week, we're, we're going to talk about um, what we're calling the rise of the new religion, right? Humanism. Listen, shouldn't we also, as Christians, uh, strive to get our younger generation to move into politics to help to change this country around? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. That's going to be part oh, of this okay, uh, part of this course. That's a good question. Oh, Very good okay. question. Right. Excellent yeah. question. We're going to get there. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and we'll talk about humanism next week and um, what some today are calling the new religion. It's not really a new religion. Uh, it's a very old religion, but it's been more codified uh, in the last 150 years or so. And we'll notice how, we'll, we'll talk about how that has developed and how that has risen over the last century. Um, we'll get into that some. Okay. Um, we've enjoyed a long time in this country to this point where we've had a limited persecution, where we've enjoyed some peace, uh, where we've been able to preach the gospel, light, limited persecution, uh, momentary light afflictions here and there. <laughs> but um, much like the growing error or the growing corruption that took place within the professing church in Rome after the Edict of Milan, the modern day professing church now has grown fat and lazy and full of worldliness. I'm not talking about a church like this. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a vast majority of what we would see as American evangelicals. The problem with American Christianity is that it's American and not Christian. Right? <laughs> that, that, that's the issue. It's American, not Christian. And the, the modern day professing church has just um, exemplified that uh, sadly. And so churches are very, I think, very ill-prepared for what's coming. And those lines, that you see it even now in certain um, um, conflicts that take place within the church. Um, most recently, conflicts over social justice. Uh, before that, conflicts related to homosexuality. They're still taking place. Uh, most recently, uh, conflicts related to whether you're going to wear a mask in church or not, right? <laughs> those kinds of things. So uh, these conflicts um, have drawn the lines, I think, more clearly with respect to the church. And um, the, the modern-day American evangelical church is ill-prepared for what's coming. And uh, I want us, we want our church to be well-prepared for what's coming. Uh, we need to cultivate, develop a sound biblical theology of public life. There will be a full frontal assault. It's already begun. It's already happening. There'll be a full frontal assault attempting to drive Christianity into deserts and caves and monasteries and convents and on top of poles uh, within the four walls of the cathedral, so to speak. Um, many professing Christians will become and already are professing Christians they will become modern-day practicing monastics, uh, unwilling to bring Christianity into the public square and face that conflict or hostility. Um, Christianity will be, will be fine to many as long as it stays within the four walls of this building or within the four walls of your home. But as soon as you bring it outside the four walls of your home or outside the four walls of this building, uh, you're going to face the wrath of a hostile, wicked, and perverse uh, culture. And we need to be prepared to do that. We cannot monasticize our faith. Uh, we cannot sequester ourselves in our homes with our Christianity or in the four walls of this church with our Christianity. God is king over all. And God rules in the kingdoms of men and he gives it to whomever he wills. And under the lordship of Jesus Christ, we're to take the gospel to the world. We're not to hole up in this building, okay? Um, with the modern church, it's a fear of man. It's unbelief. It's worldly compromise that has driven them indoors. And we need to protect ourselves against those errors. We cannot live a Christian life like that. We cannot be a church that functions like that. We must inevitably face an increasing 
more objectively defined persecution, and we must prepare ourselves to take a stand even now. We do that by formulating a good, sound biblical theology of public life. Uh, we need to have a clear, well-defined theology. We've talked about this before with, um, with how the Bible is laid out, how God reveals himself to us in his word. He does through that through indicatives and imperatives. Indicatives statements or assertions of fact, what we believe, the imperatives, how we live in light of what we believe, what we are to do, the commands that he gives us. It's the same thing with the theology of public life. We'll formulate indicatives, all the whys that are related to a theology of public life, and then we'll talk about how we are to live in accord with what we say we believe. Our objective with this series will be to simply begin with two aspects connected with the theology of public life. And those two aspects very current today with respect to the Lord's church, but we're only going to talk about two in the beginning. We'll expand on that, I think, as time goes by. But two to start. If you've got your outline, part one, we're going to consider the relationship of the church to the state. And then in part two, we're going to unpack, unpack this world's bankrupt notion of social justice. Two really current Hot topics, fresh off the burner, <laughs> fresh out of the oven uh, for the church that we're going to talk about over the next several multiple weeks together. Relationship of church to state, and then the, this issue of social justice. Part one, we're entitling a Leviathan Rising, where we'll consider the relationship between the church and the state. <clears throat> where that name came from, Leviathan Rising, there was a, uh, a 17th century uh, political philosopher and he was a humanist. His name was Thomas Hobbes. And Tho Thomas Hobbes described the state as having ultimate power and the state having ultimate authority. And that ultimate authority, that ultimate power reached into every aspect of your life. He called it favorably Leviathan, right? Had its tentacles in every aspect, should have, would have its tentacles in every aspect of your life. So how you live, how you raise your children, how you educate your children, how you interact with your spouse, how you work, don't work on the job, right? Everything came under the control and the power of the state. It was from Thomas Hobbes' bankrupt ideology that a, a divine right of kings was developed. We'll talk about what that is. Um, and the state began to encroach on personal liberties. The state began to to overflow the boundaries of its God-given authority and reaching into places where it ought not. And um, it's called a Leviathan. So we, and this, there's also a book by Glenn Sunshine that I recommend to you called A Slaying Leviathan. That's really good. Uh, dealing with this issue of government. We're calling this Leviathan Rising. Uh, Leviathan is rising. It is stretching out its tentacles into every aspect of your life. How is the Christian to respond? What are we to do about that? How are we to think about it? Uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 1, commands Christians to subject themselves to the governing authorities. Governments are appointed by God to bear the sword against evildoers. And so what then are Christians to do when the government becomes the evildoer? Are there biblical limits to governmental authority? Or... Are Christians simply to obey everything the government says whenever the government says it? How are we to understand that? And how are we to live under a government that itself has become the evildoer? In part one, Leviathan Rising, uh, we'll carefully consider the role of governments as instituted by God. We'll look at the extent of their authority. We're going to examine biblical texts, multiple, multiple texts in the New Testament that speak to our relationship to government, relationship to the state, and the limits of state authority. And we're going to develop, in the course of that, what's called a biblical theology of Christian resistance. Uh, when is it right for a Christian to resist the command of the state? Uh, how is that resistance to be lived out? What does that look like? Uh, do we have biblical authority for it, biblical justification for it? And um, how is that to be done? Part two and we'll give you some more information on this in just a minute. Part two, uh, we're entitling Social Injustice. A little play on words there. And we're going to take a look, a biblical look, at the ascendancy of what we are calling the new religion, what we're currently in. Um, you notice that social justice is pursued with religious fervor in our day. 
There is a bankrupt morality that is represented by social justice. And we're going to talk about what that is and why that is so catchy uh, in our day. Look at social injustice. Uh, at no other time in our history has secular humanism as a religious force achieved such an organized and cohesive identity as it has in our country at this particular time. It is a religion. It was a time when, um, if you remember, you had the uh, Humanistic Manifesto 1, Humanistic Manifesto 2 and 3 that came out. And there was this push on the part of humanists um, in competing, if you will, with Christianity, there was this push on the part of humanists to declare themselves a religion. And so they pursued that uh, for a period of time before they realized that was not going to fit their or suit their purpose as well. Um, they pursued it as a religion with religious fervor that uh, they wanted all the benefits of a religion, tax-exempt status and uh, uh, support for humanism and uh, the, the same kind of support that the government, quote unquote, uh, gives to uh, protected religious classes, including Christianity. They began to think to themselves, though, if we do that, we can't get into the schools any longer. If we're counted as a religion, there needs to be a separation of church and state. And so they lose their influence in the schools, which, which right now humanism is the only religion that has any um, inroads into school, public schools. We're going to talk about how the state has also encroached on education. So um, they quickly abandoned their efforts to have that qualified as a religion. But humanism is a religion. We'll talk about why. Um, secu secular humanism has weaponized the state. The state is its a governmental or authoritarian arm. And we'll talk about next week how that is, why that is. Secular humanism has an organized morality. It is not the morality of the Bible. Obviously, it is a satanic and deceptive counterfeit. We'll look at that as compared with biblical morality. Secular humanism has an organized mission. We'll talk about that. Secular humanism dominates politics, education, health care, government, media. Secular humanism dominates and has weaponized all of those spheres. Secular humanism, with all that authority and with all that power, is encroaching in dramatic ways upon the church, and um, Christians need to be prepared to take a stand against that, and it's encroached in significant ways upon the family. And so we'll look at what the Bible has to say about our responsibilities in the church and in the family and how we are to stand against that. Miss Gina. What is your response with respect to the doctrine of lesser magistrates? Yeah, we're actually going to talk about lesser, lesser magistrates in detail. Uh, a matter of fact, hold that question for just a second. We're going to briefly go through the outline, and I'll show you where that's going to fit in and why, and we'll explain a little bit about what the doctrine of lesser magistrates is. So... Um, in both parts of this study, what we're going to endeavor to do is to apply biblical truth to our circumstances, right? And how we are to live. Schaefer asked that question, how then should we live? How then should we live? Uh, we want to look at that from the Bible. Lessons for Lot in the city of Sodom. It does no good for us to sort of put our face over, our hands over our face or put our head in the sand and sort of pretend we've got it really good in here. Like really, really good. It is really sweet. Uh, this is an oasis. It's an outpost of heaven, right? And uh, but we can't um, we can't monasticize our faith. Uh, we need to leave from here with the truth and go to our world with the gospel and preach the gospel to this lost world. And that includes engaging the culture, engaging the government, engaging our world. Okay. Uh, and we need to inform our consciences so that with Luther, we can say, here I stand, I can do no other. Right? When the persecution comes, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Okay, let me give you a, a brief um, outline of the, or, uh, an expanded outline, if you will. If you look at your uh, handout, you see the course outline on the front page there? 
I'll expand on each of those topics for us briefly here so you know exactly what this um, is going to entail over the next multiple um, weeks and months. And I want to be able to uh, answer questions. So if you've got questions, um, let me know. First, uh, under part one, Leviathan Rising, the authoritarianism of the new religion. Um, humanism has commandeered government, has seized control of the state, so to speak, and has weaponized the state for its own ends and purposes. And we'll talk about what that looks like and why. We'll talk about under the rise of the new religion, point A there, humanism and its precepts, historical development of humanism, um, what is being viewed as a recent American revolution uh, against Christianity and for humanism, how it's displayed in our day, the weapons of its tyranny. And that's what it is, is tyranny, government and politics, school, media, economics. And we'll look at the new code, its new code of morality, which is social justice, virtue signaling, cancel culture, critical race theory. We'll look at all of that. Secondly, the tentacles of tyranny. Uh, Christians have lost sight of the biblical weights and measures by which we are to evaluate the limits of government. Um, in, in years past, centuries past, this was something the church was very adept at. They understood these things. Why? Because they, they lived in a time period where they were suffering persecution from the state on a regular basis. Um, maybe you're like me, you're used to hearing someone say, you know, uh, Romans chapter 13, we're to obey the governing authorities. And that's true. We were to obey Romans 13. We're to obey the Lord. Amen. But they'll say, and that text was written under Nero, one of the most heinous uh, Roman emperors of all time. And by saying that, what is meant is that, and Christians are to, to obey Nero no matter what. That's what's implied. But they forget, they forget that Christians by the thousands were being killed for Christian resistance to Nero and the Roman Empire. Uh, why, were, why was it that Christians were being thrown to the, the lions in the Colosseum or impaled and burned as tar-pitched candles on Nero's roads? Why was that the case? It's because Christians had a developed theology of Christian resistance to tyranny. And there's a reason for that. We're going to talk about why that reason is. And some people come to that with sort of presuppositions about Romans 13, Point C there on your notes, righting wrongs from Romans, we're going to break down Romans 13. It'll probably take a couple of weeks to do that um, and take very careful, a very careful look at exactly what Romans 13 is saying and asserting and how we apply that to the Christian life. And um, I think we'll be, we'll be able to come to a, a common conclusions about that. They're going to be very, very helpful. Um, sphere sovereignty, D on your notes. What is sovereignty? What is absolute sovereignty? Who has absolute sovereignty? One alone has absolute sovereignty. There are then spheres of delegated authority from our absolute sovereign. And those include family, um, godly offspring, the raising, health, the welfare, the education, the discipleship of our children, um, a sphere of delegated authority is given to the church and a sphere of delegated authority is given to the civil government. Um, but there is a proper function of state sovereignty. We're going to talk about that. That's to be under the authority of God. Kings are not a law to themselves. Samuel Rutherford wrote a book that we're going to talk about, um, Lex Rex, and uh, really, really helpful. And how the king is not a law unto himself, but the king himself is under the law. And we'll talk about how that uh, impacts us as well. Um, e, historical development of church-state relationships. Um, we're going to see how this theology has developed over time. From Augustine and the city of God uh, to, through the, the divine right of kings, Luther and Luther's two kingdoms theology. Um, and then to English particular Baptists, where our heritage comes from and liberty of conscience. We'll talk about where inalienable rights come from and why that's mentioned in our Declaration of Independence. Um, we'll talk about John Locke, our form of government here. We'll talk about the American Revolution a little bit. I think it's going to be really helpful, the historical development of church-state relations. Next, we'll talk about Lex Rex, the law and the king. We already mentioned that. 
Um, G, vindicie contra tyrannis, uh, defense against tyrants. That's another book that written, exceedingly helpful um, book regarding Christian resistance. We're going to talk about that. And then we'll look at um, the biblical basis for Christian resistance, and we'll examine all of the biblical texts or the pertinent, the material biblical texts that have to do with Christian resistance. And then we'll look at, lastly, in this section, part one, practical lessons for Lot. Um, I remember reading here not recently um, one speaking of the restrictions that they've instituted on the church in California. Um, one uh, pastor wrote, I'd rather sing and die than live and not sing. I like that, right? I think that's a, a good, healthy attitude for a Christian to have. I'd rather sing and die than live and not sing. Um, a doctrine of Christian resistance, a doctrine of Christian engagement, recovering the nature and function of the kingdom of God on this planet, uh, how that um, works, fits together with the kingdoms of men here. And then practical issues. To Gina's question a minute ago, we'll deal with uh, the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. Luther, um, we'll talk about this more as we go. Luther, um, originally sort of against um, a theology of Christian resistance, but himself in hiding from the government under the protection of Frederick uh, uh, in Germany, um, and then talking to his peers, came to the conclusion that his theology was, was wrong and that Christians are to resist tyranny. And why? You know, he developed a theology. And so uh, Luther, other reformers at the time, developed a doctrine from the Bible um, called the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. And th there are problems with that doctrine in the sense that, um, and you can see it in the way that Luther, other reformers applied their theology to civil life at that time. There's a problem with that theology in the sense that um, uh, it... Um, necessitates or involves governmental involvement in enforcing the uh, inalienable rights given to us by God, um, where we can't exactly count on government to help us enforce that. And so from the doctrine of lesser magistrates and Luther's um, uh, theology of public life arose others after him that developed this more clearly, I think, from the Bible, and chiefly among those is Abraham Kuyper, um, the Dutch theologian, who um, wrote an article on sphere sovereignty we'll talk about. But um, so I, I think the doctrine of Christian resistance or a doctrine of civil engagement on the part of the Christian has been developed beyond Luther and has developed beyond his doctrine of lesser magistrates. There is um, some reason to include um, lesser government. So in other words, what this sort of deals with is if the federal government uh, is doing evil, then you appeal to the state government to help take a stand against federal evil. <laughs> if the state government is involved in state evil, then you take a stand with your local government against state evil and federal evil, right? You see how this sort of trickles down. It's a doctrine of lesser magistrates. But we're going to talk about... Um, a better way maybe to look at that. And um, I think it'll be helpful to you when we get there. Okay, um, that answer your question, Miss Gina? Somewhat? Okay, somewhat. We'll talk more. Or if you have questions, we can talk after. Um, in uh, part two then, we'll wrap this up. Part two, a social injustice. Uh, we'll talk about then uh, theology or the bankrupt morality of the new religion. Um, the morality of the new religion, which is universal equality, universal autonomy. And that is, um, we'll talk about why that is. But the morality of secular humanism is universal autonomy, the autonomy of man that expresses itself in universal equality, which we see all over the place nowadays as social justice. And this is so pertinent to us because social justice is um, just invaded the professing church, it is staggering to me, like amazing to me, how many otherwise godly men or otherwise like respectable churches have been given over to this bankrupt ideology and how 
quickly. Like it, it is just like a blitzkrieg through the professing church today. Um, we're going to talk about that um, and look at that biblically. The magisterium of the new religion, which the magisterium of the new religion is the state. And we'll talk about that. The sacraments of the new religion, race, abortion, homosexuality, social justice, the mission of the new religion is social justice, right? This um, universal equality. And that is what they go into all the world to preach to every creature. <laughs> universal equality. And then practical lessons for Lot in the city of Sodom. And uh, Sodom will end that. Old wisdom applied to the new religion. Okay. Um, what questions do you have? Briefly, we've got some time for a couple. Sorry to ramble on like that the, the entire hour, but I, I did want to give you a good introduction of what we're going to be doing over the next few months together. Any questions, thoughts? Yes, sir. Um, when you were mentioning before, oh, you were mentioning before about uh, the persecution that comes, uh, I know I've heard in, in England right now, uh, if you speak out and somebody says that offends me, hmm. you know, you could be arrested or actually fined for that. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of street preachers have uh, had to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah, we had a pastor that visited our church. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, met him, um, Steve. I'm trying to remember his last name now. Uh, visited our church from a church up north. And um, many of you heard the name Tony Miano. Tony Miano attends his church up there. Well, he was down here on vacation visiting, visited our church. And uh, Tony Miano has been arrested multiple times. And if I remember the, the account correctly, he's been arrested in the United States, he's been arrested in Canada, been arrested in the UK. And he was standing on a corner preaching in the UK and reading the Bible uh, and reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Someone said, um, you know, can you read that again? And it's the text that specifically mentions homosexuality. He reads the text and is arrested. Um, so that's happening more frequently. And there, there are loud voices calling for that here and terming it uh, hate speech, um, that not all speech is protected speech. And so if, if you know, we're, we're not to be naive and think that that can't take place here. It's happening increasingly. Um, and you just saw um, in the last month or so, um, James Coates being arrested in Canada for taking a stand against government encroachment. So these things are coming. Uh, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So what other questions? Last question or two, if you have one. Okay. I really pray, pray this, this study is going to be helpful. I think you'll, as we get into some of these subjects, you'll realize how helpful. Uh, when we really break down Romans 13, when we talk about sphere sovereignty, uh, I think these things are going to be really helpful. And then um, as we talk about what we're going to do, Francis Schaeffer in uh, his book, A Christian Manifesto, a Christian manifesto written really in uh, response to human, humanism manifesto. Um, Schaefer talks about a bottom line and how, you know, in, in terms of Christian resistance, we're to flee persecution. Where we can't flee, we defend against or um, resist persecution. And where there is no fleeing, where there is no defense, there's the use of force to defend, right? Uh, and Schaefer talks about um, a bottom line for Christians and thinking through a theology of public life, um, sort of situational awareness. I was talking to Justin not long ago about situational awareness, you know, where as a police officer, you think about the situation that you can put yourself in. And if I find myself in that situation, what will I do, right? Situational awareness. Uh, we as Christians need to have some situational awareness, if I find myself in these kinds of circumstances, uh, what is it that I'm going to do? How should we then live? Right? Let's pray. Get you out of we'll talk. If you have questions, please feel free to see me after service today. and We can talk more about it. Father in heaven, uh, thank you, Lord, for the clear instruction that your word gives. Just so grateful, Lord. And um, I wonder at it again at how thorough uh, how clear, how far-reaching, comprehensive um, your word is, how it applies to life in every area, every aspect of our lives. Very grateful for that. Uh, help us, Lord, to think through this clearly, biblically, faithfully, and may we uh, develop a theology of public life that is honoring to you, faithful to your word, 
And Lord, may we uh, have the strength supplied by your spirit to live according to what your word says. And may we be faithful to you at this time. The torch has been passed to us, and we will soon pass it along to those that come after us. But during this time in which we hold the torch, Lord, I pray we'd be faithful with it. We love you. We thank you. And be with us now as we um, worship you during the morning service. And may the saints be edified. May Christ be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.